So this is a fairly complex looking board, but it will allow us to understand a fairly complex concept of the galvanic cell. And that will set the foundation for the discussion of all electrochemical cells after this. So we'll work through this piece by piece and hopefully you'll soon be able to see how the flow of electrical energy operates much like a circuit and how this circuit can be used in order to generate voltage and ultimately generate energy that we can use for our purposes. So the first thing that you should notice about any electrochemical cell is that it converts chemical energy to electrical energy. And this is due to the fact that you have two parallel reactions going on at the same time. You have a reduction and an oxidation. And because of this mnemonic here, we know that the reduction occurs at the cathode and the oxidation occurs at the anode. And you should know that reduction is the gain of electrons, whereas oxidation is the loss of electrons. So what I've set up here is a fairly simple standard reduction table. The standard reduction potential measured in volts of turning a copper 2 plus ion into solid copper and of turning a zinc 2 plus ion into solid zinc. You'll notice that copper has a positive reduction potential, and that means that if you were to reduce copper, it would be favorable for you, whereas zinc has a negative one, which means that the reduction isn't particularly favorable, but the oxidation is. And this underscores something very, very important, and that is that for any spontaneous cell that you're working with, anything that yields energy, the side with the greater standard reduction potential will always be the cathode end. So it will always be the end where the reduction occurs. And so what we've done here is we've drawn the cathode here to the right and the anode to the left. And that's typical for what you'll see when you're looking at an illustration. Usually the anode will be on the left and the cathode will be on the right. And what we see going on here is that on this side we're oxidizing solid zinc. And so we're taking the solid zinc, we're going to have it lose two electrons, loss of electrons is oxidation, and that's going to yield a zinc cation. So the solid zinc from the anode here is being converted into aqueous zinc cations. Those two electrons that are yielded will move from here across this element, this could be a voltmeter, which is often used in your basic illustrations, but it could later on become a resistor or some circuit element that you're using the flow of electrons to power. And the electrons will move over here until they reach the cathode side. And the cathode side is where you see the reduction occurring, where you take the copper cation and you add two electrons to it in order to produce solid copper. And so a few things that you'll notice already. First, the electrons are going to move from the anode to the cathode. And that is always true. Electrons always move from the anode to the cathode. The other thing to be aware of is that current is described as the movement of positive charge. And so if electrons are moving to the right, that means that current will be moving to the left. And so current is flowing from the cathode to the anode. And then the third thing to be aware of, and this is not true for all types of electrochemical cells, but you'll often see it. If you have aqueous cations here, those will tend to plate at the cathode side. So they'll become solid and then they will plate that, that positive electrode there. And that can be very useful, which we'll see later with electrolytic cells. But these are some of the basics. For any spontaneous cell, the one with the greater or more positive standard reduction potential will be the cathode. That's true for any spontaneous cell. Whichever one of these numbers is higher, that will be the reaction that occurs at the cathode. If that is happening, then you'll see that the electrons are going to move from the anode to the cathode. And that means that current is moving in the opposite direction because current is opposite of the travel of electrons since electrons are negative and current is positive movement. So with that established, now what we can do is move through the entire circuit in order to see where the energy is flowing. And we'll understand why this is such an energetically favorable 
operation and that can be used to help you use this as a battery to operate a machine or something of that nature. And so what we'll first do is we will look at the overall energy equation. Remember that when we're finding the standard maximum energy or E standard max, what we're doing is we're adding the reduction potential at the cathode side with the oxidation potential at the anode side. And remember that the oxidation potential is basically reversing the sign of this. And so we have negative 0.76 for reducing zinc. So to oxidize zinc, we will end up getting plus 0.76. And what that yields is a positive E standard max, and that means this will occur spontaneously. So that is why we always look for the greater E standard of reduction to be our cathode or reducing end. It's because it will always generate a positive E max value there. So what's happening, we'll move from left to right here and then we'll complete the entire circuit. So what happens first is that this solid zinc is oxidized into a zinc cation and these two electrons are released. These electrons then travel through this wire, they reach the cathode end, and then the aqueous copper ions are turned into a solid. Those are reduced into the solid copper that's occurring over here. So that is the general flow of the electrons, and that is what generates the current that you then use later on if you replace this voltmeter with a resistor or some other component, or if you just attach this battery to a circuit. Now, an issue arises if you let this run for too long in that way. And what it is, is that if you keep adding positive zinc ions to this bath and you keep removing the positive copper ions from that, the electrons will no longer be attracted over to this side just because of the energetic favorability. Eventually, what will happen is all of this positive stuff will attract the electrons to move back toward it because negatively charged things are always attracted to positively charged things. And so we need some way of allowing this, this circuit to continue so that we don't get a short circuit. And a short circuit is basically when rather than completing the whole circuit, instead the electron gets up here and then moves right back. It shortens the circuit. And the way that we prevent that short circuit from occurring is through the use of this salt bridge. A salt bridge, which is often something like an aqueous potassium chloride solution, basically is a source of ions and those ions can then move to their respective places in order to ensure that this doesn't become too positively charged and this doesn't lose too much of its positive charge throughout the life of the battery. And so what will happen is every time you gain a zinc cation here, you'll end up sending two chlorine anions. So each of these has a negative one charge two of those will make up for the zinc and that will allow this to be electrically neutral once again so that the electrons that are being released are no longer drawn back in this direction. Similarly, you keep losing positively charged copper ions in this bath here surrounding the cathode. And what you do to replace that is you take two potassium ions and bring those over so that every time you lose plus two of charge, you're gaining two units of charge as well. And so that allows these two baths to remain electrically neutral, to stay in the same sort of electrical position they were to start out. And what that means is that the favorability of the reduction and oxidation reaction can be the prevalent force that is allowing all of this to continue. So that is the primary way that this works. And you need the salt bath if you have two separate, salt bridge if you have two separate baths like this, because you need to keep those two baths charged and equal so that they don't get excessively positive or excessively negative and throw off the main motivation that was allowing this circuit to work in the first place. Once you get those electrons flowing, that is the equivalent of having a current. And whenever you have a current, that means you can perform electrical work. You can have electrical power, and that generates different forms of energy if you let it run for a period of time. Now, the next thing to be aware of is that for any battery to be useful, it has to carry on continuously. And in order for that to happen, you have to have a circuit where energy is traveling throughout and it continues to replenish itself. 
And that's what happens with a battery for quite a long period of time. And so what we're going to do is we're going to trace the flow of negative energy throughout this whole system and show you that it actually is an entire circuit. And so in order to follow the negative energy, one way we can do it is by following these electrons. And the other thing is we can look at the negative energy flow as being opposite the direction of positive energy flow. So for example, if a positive cation here is moving toward this, that essentially means that a negative energy is flowing this way instead. And so let's just start from the left and draw out the entire circuit. And this is something that if you can do this with every type of electrochemical cell you see, you'll be able to understand the forces that allow them to be useful and productive for any type of machinery or electrophysics. So we're going to start here and what happens is we have this oxidation where the solid zinc turns into a cation and it yields two electrons. These electrons move up here, travel through the voltmeter, and reach their way to the cathode. Now when they reach the cathode, these electrons are then paired with the cation. And so the cation moves toward the cathode from the bath. And we can sort of treat that as since a positive charge is moving that way, it sort of looks like the negative energy is flowing that way. Now the next step is that in order to keep this bath neutrally charged, you have the potassium ions moving this way. And whenever a positive charge moves that way, you can then trace the negative energy as going in the opposite direction. And then finally, we're going to follow this chlorine all the way into there. And the last step is that since zinc is moving from the anode into the bath, we can say that the negative energy is moving in that direction. And so what we've done now is we've completed an entire circuit. First, you're generating negatively charged electrons, and those are moving. When those move, those serve the purpose of basically making positively charged things move in this direction, and so that kind of continues the flow of negative energy there. When the salt bridge tries to replenish the copper cation in this bath, then that is equivalent to negative energy flowing through this way. And then finally, when the chlorine moves over here, to compensate for the gain of this cation, negative energy flows this way. And so what you see here now is a complete circuit. And the last thing to consider is what limits the life of a battery? What is the thing that makes it so a battery can no longer continue? And the bottom line is that it's whatever is the first thing that runs out. And so you have the solid zinc that is being used up as this battery runs. So if you run out of zinc, at the anode side, that could be something that limits the life of the battery. You also have this aqueous copper that is being used up in order to plate the cathode. And that is another thing that could limit it. If you run out of copper ions first, that is the thing that limits the life of the battery. And then the third thing is this potassium chloride salt bath. If that's the first thing that runs out, then that is the limiting factor in the life of the battery. But notice that in any battery, there are various factors that can run out first, and whichever one does is what limits the life of the battery. But until then, it just continues to exist as a circuit that travels this way, and it moves negative charge, it moves electrons from the anode side to the cathode side, and then the salt bridge can replenish those if necessary. And you have a complete circuit that is used to keep those electrons traveling, and as long as those electrons are traveling, you have current, and as long as you have current, then that can be very electrically useful for you.